learning network. Today's event is around return on investment. The Centre for Work and Learning project has been a three-year project around transforming workforce development. And it's really important that as an employer, we begin to consider training, not as an expense, but as an investment in the cultural capital and the human capital that we have within our business. So I'm really pleased that today what we're able to do is present to you the findings of two of a series of projects we've been doing to demonstrate and reflect different aspects of how we can capture, measure and report return on investment for, uh, for employers. I'd like to hand over now to my colleague Sarah from Sussex Coast College who will be presenting the first of those reports. Thank you Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah Watson and I'm the HE Employer Engagement Manager at Sussex Coast College Hastings in the In Business team. And my workshop is going to be about a new approach that we took at Sussex Coast College um, to evaluating the return on investment that companies get. We looked at the foundation degree in mechanical engineering, which is a, a two-year part-time course and employer focused. So how do you know that your courses are a worthwhile investment for employers? they're getting value for money. We challenged the traditional approach um, looking at um, a traditional financial measure and uh, we took a, a qualitative approach. Well we looked at doing that in a qualitative way um, rather than looking at a traditional directly measurable financial return so we looked at various aspects um, and we did something slightly different in that we got uh, employers to rank what their priorities were in order of importance and then we looked at how we were addressing those. Are they coming back to purchase courses from you again? So that would be one measure that they're getting some, they feel they're getting some sort of bank of money. They're not going elsewhere. Yes, there has um, there's been a scholarly activity being put in for um, making some uh, amendments to the business concepts module and updating that in line with what employers want. Um, that's one potential on that particular course. Um, and then there's a, um, plans to uh, look at the level three um, BTEC using the same methodology, so, so that's another impact. Um, and I think it's also having an impact on, on the way the course is delivered as well. Did you get a sense of uh, doing the return on investment project that employers saw investment in training for a, a good use of company money? Yes, we certainly did. Um, yeah. Interesting project. I, I love to see the, uh, the the statement that went. We saw the return on investment instantly, and you think, well, you can't walk for anything better than that, really, can you? Anything beyond that is trying to pin down what it is. Thank you very much for some useful questions, and I'm sure when Sarah takes those back and looks at the level three, we can continue to refine this as a, as a tactic and as a technique. But I think it was, it was very interesting and a useful model that, as Sarah's illustrated there, you can take that idea and put any questions that you think are appropriate in there. Sit down with your employers when you've got the time and design the questions and use that as a way to sort of look at it. So I'm Paul Levy, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Brighton Centrum and also a facilitator of uh, leadership training and I'm going to be trying to turn uh, traditional notions of return on investment um, right on its head and presenting a very, very different view of uh, that, that concept. This is very work in progress and um, what's resulting from this is probably going to be a rather bold attempt to turn our return on investment on its head. So I'm quite happy for you to kind of knock that idea back at me. Um, and I'm going to be referring to classic ROI. 
Um, but then I'm going to suggest some other forms of return on investment. I think the traditional, what I might call classic uh, return on investment, hasn't changed for years, and I don't believe it ever really properly applied to training, particularly non-technical training, such as leadership. So classical um, ones was all about numbers, and, and, and often the ac activity was done after the training was over, which I think is too late. This is how you maximise return on investment. You actually have to take action, a preventative action at each of the four stages. Now, whether you can measure it, I don't know. I'm going to suggest you don't need to. It's certainly not according to our plan. So you need to be somebody who is regularly trying to ramp up the value of truth to make sure people are in honest states with each other. They've set the right learning objectives and not safe ones, but they've set the ones that are really needed for the business, which is what I think this study tried to do in the first part. It tried to so what are your priorities? Let's not pretend you don't have them. You do. So have we succeeded or not? It would have been interesting if that degree hadn't met any of the priorities. That would have been a real slap in the face and it would have been a useful one to get. You have the call to action and also anchoring action about making the learning events actually have actions that are linked back into the workplace. And so I've got a couple of concepts, one which I call instinctive return on investment, which is where the client has already got a very deep, and businesses are very instinctive, quite often and intuitive, and an, an instinctive decision to go with a particular form of training because it already knows it's going to get return on investment. Now that might sound quite risky, but in a lot of cases it's right, particularly if it has a good relationship with the trainer and has done its homework. So, so definitely at the moment, I think it's only working because I've got a long-standing relationship with clients. I don't know how well you could do instinctive ROI, because how do you get the instinct? The only way that I've found at the moment is you have quite a lot of orientation. So instead of an open day at the university, the university goes and spends a couple of days in the organisation, if that's possible. I know Barry flies out to countries, and you probably immerse yourself a bit in the cultures of those countries. So it's about it going the other way. It's about us being able to be, we get the sense of value from the context the university is no longer the only context, so I think that's key for new clients. And so <coughs> confidence would come from knowing the context. That's the key thing. Do we budget that? I don't know, but it's happening in advance. We're looking to up value through having lots of contextual wisdom from the start. Um, but what you're trying to create is an instinctive faith in the value that the forthcoming training is going to happen. So ROI is assumed. The second thing is, I believe there's a conflict of interest between the trainer and any form of return on investment measure. I think it's the aim of a good trainer to risk risk being thrown out. But as you go into the zone of discomfort, sometimes you've only got training for a few days, it's not always a, a degree course, you will bring people into their zone of discomfort. And if you ask people for their feedback there, they will say, that's the worst day of my life. I don't get this, I'm not quite sure what this is all about. I can't see the relevance of this. And I've got enough longitudinal evidence anecdotal mostly, of people bumping up into me in the street now and saying, I really hated your workshop. I remember what I wrote on the feedback sheet, but I just, I'm glad I found you because that changed my life. So I've got a problem here that I believe real return on investment isn't something that will easily be measurable on the day or even briefly afterwards because, and this is where centric work comes in, the purpose of good learning, and there's lots of theory around this, is to use Kurt Lewin's kind of theory, is to unfreeze stuff. And that's painful and uncomfortable. And people become disorientated and confused. And quite often ROI studies are too bolted on quickly, part of the same resource models quite often, to train it. So they collect data just at the wrong point. And people will either therefore lie and say really nice things. I, you know, say, I, I say how brilliant my doctor is because I don't want to upset him. Um, or you better not complain in this restaurant because the chef's fit on the food, you know. Um, immediate, or they'll do the opposite. They'll be in such a state of discomfort, they'll say that what could be longitudinally very high value training is actually horrible, awful, blah, 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 and so on. And not many employees will do that. They won't stand out. I do believe there will continue to be a place for classic return on investment, and I think that's something that, uh, that we recognise. But how to make that move towards instinctive ROI? That's really got me thinking and whether it always has to come through a short ROI or classic ROI and eventually we get to, to the instinctive model. Hmm. Something, something for us to think about. Thank you very much to, to both of our speakers.
Thank you very much for, for sparing your time. And feel free to suggest any other kind of uh, examples of, uh, of sessions that you'd like to learn more about. Thank you.